We hit some things in Romans 9 and Romans 11 that perfectly add to what we're saying. Um, so um, let's just begin with verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. I will read a little further. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. <clears throat> so what we have is, um, we have a flow coming out of Romans 8, where it has been a picture to us of Christ in his selfless giving um, that brought about certain things. And you see that particularly um, in Romans 8, verse 28. And it begins to just talk about the benefits that we have gotten from him, from him, him who, Christ crucified, him who, the Lamb of God, him who, him who was always the father's um, object of, of focus and of importance to us. There is no original in, intention of God without us being found in him. In him. Not with him or loved by him alone or important to God, but in him, and as such, we are no longer who we were. We are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We are, um, we are, we, we have become by him what God had in his heart when he made creation and what was planned to happen in that creation. And so, but it, but it wasn't just that we would be found in him theologically. <clears throat> Here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> I think, um, I just think so many people kind of, and not everybody does, but I mean so many do have this, this concept of being in Christ. And what that does is that's just another soother. It's another channel of blessing. It's another um, self-focused thing if we don't see something greater than ourselves in it. Um, first of all, to get in Christ, you had to go through the cross. And that's, that's the, that's the foundation of in Christ. There is no, you, you know, a thief and a robber will try to come in another way. But there's only one way, and that's through the door, through the cross, and through Christ crucified. And so um, that's what makes you a sheep of his fold. That's what makes you that. <clears throat> and outside of that, you were probably a wolf. Um, and so, so the, the reality of that is not theological, nor is anything in the Lord. There is no theological anything that in the Lord. There's only the Lord. And finding the Lord in, in him, meaning the him of the situation, the him of being in him. It's not, I'm in him. It's, I'm in him. I'm joined to him. I am found in him. And all that, all that springs from our bosom should be him, not us. And if it's still us, 
then it doesn't mean we're not born again. It doesn't mean we're not in the family. And it doesn't mean that we probably are going to be saved and go to heaven. It means that we have failed of what was in his heart, and that was that we would become conformed to the hem of that situation, not just in him theologically so that we're safe, but so that we would be conformed to that. Now, the thing that's going to happen in Romans 9 is it's going to start throwing us curves because we have wrong concepts of, well, yeah, wrong concepts of Romans 9, 10, and 11, frankly, most for the most part. That's my opinion, and who am I? Pastor of a few sheep in a small town that, you know. So, I, you know, my opinion is really worth it. But my opinion is that there is a, a incredible lack of grasp of Christ in these scriptures, and we're only seeing doctrines, and and we don't even understand the doctrines, basically. Um, so I'm going to start back. Uh, well, what we just read is that Paul, had, Paul, this man, he doesn't even need a name to the Lord. He is after his image. Jesus would point to him and say, "There's me." And there's what one with me is all about right there. I, and it's found in these words. I, you know, first of all, he says the truth in Christ. He didn't just say the truth. The truth in Christ is the lamb. And he's about to say the truth in Christ, which is purity, O lamb. And he's saying that um, because to for him to say anything opposite of that is a lie. Because the, the cross ended it. The end of the world happened at the cross. If you'll come to the cross. You understand what, what that means. I mean, it devastates you. It devastates everyone, but it doesn't devastate everyone at the same time. <laughs> it devastates them as they come to see it and acknowledge it and say, that's that's the end of me right there. And that's the beginning of something brand new. And his name is Jesus, but he is the Lamb of God. I say the truth that's in him. I don't say the truths that are in me. You know, I say the truths that are in him. I've found these truths to be beyond truths. I've found them to be who I am now in resurrection, in oneness. And, and so to this one, like I said, I mean, Jesus, Jesus doesn't get off on names. He says, that's me, that's joined to me, that's of me, that's after my kind. We say, don't tell a lie, you know, well, did you take the pencil or not? You know. So we, we say, um, no, I didn't take it when we did. And we go, oh, my God, I'm horrible. Oh, how can I live with myself? Oh, you'll, you're living with yourself. All right. It's got nothing to do with that pencil. And it's got everything to do with everything that you do if it's not Christ is a lie. Even good things, you know, even good things. What is it a lie of? It's a lie of all that is truth in Jesus. I say the truth in Jesus. I don't just say the truth. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean it. Can you hear? You know, he's Jewish. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> but Paul is not speaking as a Jew. He's speaking as one that is found in him, that he's, found, he's been found in him, not having his own. And so um, you hear him breathing forth the spirit, this lamb, this, this one 
that um, that Paul himself in the previous chapter said, shall height or depth or principalities or powers or things present or things to come or any other things separated from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? No. Okay. So our definition, which we, we discussed that somewhat, but our definition of that then is, um, am I still loved or am I, you know, um, because God hasn't done this for me lately, does he still love me? Or have I sinned and didn't know it? All this, going off on all this stuff. Um, that's, our, that's our comprehension of the love of God in Christ. Instead of, I am in great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For my brethren, that's that is a clear, not just signal. That is a blast of glory that says he is not even looking at circumstances to make up his mind whether he's in the love of God or not. The love of God. And he's the one who said this over in Corinthians, the love of God has me, or the love of God constrains me. The love of God constrains me. And this love isn't just, oh, I'm, I'm in such sorrow for you guys. Good luck. But it is, I would, I would literally be accursed for you. That's Christ crucified. That's the Lamb. That's who that is. That's not Paul. That's the love of God. That's the nature of love, agape love. That's the nature of that is try, uh, that has been tried to explain that love in terms of a slaughtered lamb. All right. So, greater love hath no man but he lays down his life. And so there is that, <clears throat> that discussion in Romans 8 at the end of, of the realities of this shell, height or depth or any, no, none of the, I am persuaded, Paul is persuaded in Romans 8. In Romans 9, no, it's not about being persuaded of something. It's not persuaded that if this happened, you know, we should be the, it is, I am, I am filled up. I am overcome by him who is in me in the form of the lamb. And I must be the bride or the, or the wife of the lamb because I would literally be accursed for them. A curse from Christ, not just a cursed. We know Paul loved the Lord. All right, so that sets the stage. And again, we're going we're gonna to be skipping over parts because I've covered it at length in these other, in this other thing, book. So let's begin at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Verse 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth. It's not because you're making the right decisions because you're so holy. Nor of him that runneth, nor is it have anything to do with how good you think you're doing. And Paul addressed that in Galatians, the first chapter, when the original Greek there says, and I was out distancing all of my brothers in this law thing, only to find out that all of his efforts, not with God, you know, there was no boasting, not before God. And you might remember that in chapter 
5, but also in other places there. Not of him that runneth. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth, E-T-H, mercy, continually shows mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Okay. Therefore hath he mercy on whom uh, on uh, whom he will have mercy. Those are added words. And whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why does he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had before prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. <clears throat> All right, so there is, this, there is this stuff that he's throwing out here for, uh, I'll read it, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Um, we read the scriptures in light of earth people. We read these scriptures in light of earth people. <clears throat> well, what if I'm Pharaoh? I don't like this. You know. Uh, and even good people. They still kind of go, well, I, don't, I don't know about this. You know, what kind of God are we serving or whatever? Um, but there is a, there is a vast chasm between us and God in understanding and in seeing. We don't, we don't, we don't think there is. <laughs> we don't. I'm guilty. We don't think there is. We don't think we're that far apart. But his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. So let's, <clears throat> let's take a look at a little bit of this. I'll just read some. Sometimes we, we read scriptures with our own perceptions. For example, when we read these verses... Some can have a reaction. God seems to be unfair. He is good to some, but not to others. He shows mercy to some, but leaves others without help. And we read those scriptures, you know. Why doth he yet find fault? That's the reaction to that. Because we're of this earth. Because we don't, we don't know what he's doing. And because we haven't discovered the one on the throne is a lamb. So we don't, so we, we can't imagine. We apply this to, we use the same terminology and the same definitions for this that we did before we were a Christian. Showing mercy, show me mercy, you know? And what all that means, and we'll get into some of that. As we study the exodus of Israel, we see the blessing, the great blessing of God in freeing his people from bondage. Amen? Bringing them out. And we go, oh, yeah, he's blessing Israel. And he's hardening Pharaoh. <clears throat> but when we look at Pharaoh, we may ponder the fact that God hardened him with no thought of blessing and mercy toward him. 
Now, that's the common thought right there. That's what people think when they read these scriptures. As we study the Exodus, um, let's see. But Pharaoh, my subtitle here is, Who Was Shown Mercy? But Pharaoh experienced God's mercy and blessing most of his life. It is God who raises up kings. Therefore, Pharaoh was seated on the throne of Egypt and invested with power by God himself. Reading from Daniel 417, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. All right. So we, if, if we are Israel, in under attack and under siege from Babylon and we're on the verge of captivity and we see that what is happening here in Jerusalem, the last bastion, the last stronghold before Nebuchadnezzar runs over the whole country there is no food and no way to sneak food in and out. People are starving. People are eating their own children. People are, there is, they are, uh, they're wondering where God is. And of course, Jeremiah been prophesying the whole time this was going to happen. And your reaction shouldn't be to fight everything that seems bad to you. But you do, and your minds are set that way, and they're fixed, and they're fixed because it is the mind of the flesh. And he's already said in Romans 8, the mind of the flesh is at enmity with God. But this is right. It's got to be right. I mean, this is, this, I'm right, and this is wrong, when in reality, this is right, this captivity thing, and we're wrong, but we can't see it, and we don't see it, and we don't know it, and we have no clue of it, and we, we're not in bondage, you're in bondage. And to consider that Nebuchadnezzar is so blessed, like Pharaoh, sits on top of a great kingdom, has everything he wants, just like Pharaoh. And we're being mistreated and there's no mercy for us. And they said stuff like that. Jeremiah and all of all those books are full of that stuff, you know, the way they looked at it. And yet, the real mercy there was Israel was being shown mercy. They were the goat that was sent out into the wilderness and spared. And Jerusalem was slain. <clears throat> Anybody remember that from, let's see, back in like, <laughs> we, we can't read this with a proper mind because we stand in judgment and we are no judges we are no judges and besides when the judges ruled it was bad right when the, God called them judges and said, this is the worst, <laughs> you know? And Jesus said, thou shalt not judge, for with what measure you judge, it's gonna come back on your head. Amen? <clears throat> all right, well, we know all that, but we don't know it. You, do you understand what I mean? We don't know it. We haven't, we haven't been married to the mind of Christ so that we know it by that. We know it by doctrinal teaching. We go, yes, you know, especially around here. You know, we've been around this a lot. We know this. You don't need to go over this again, Randy. Yes, I do. Yes. We need to find God's meanings. Yes. 
we need to. If we don't, we're just carnal people running around trying to serve God in foolishness. And he's, you know, I'm sorry, but that's what he sees when he looks at that. He goes, this is just foolishness. You have, you have no clue. You have stayed with your definitions. You have stayed with your preferences. You have stayed with your prejudices. And why? Because when you were this age, this happened, and you really liked that. And when you were at this age, this happened, and you didn't like that. And so you said, I don't want that in my life, but I want that. And you formed. You formed out of what? The earth. You formed out of the earth. And you became one of those rock people in that movie, Noah. <laughs> you just became part of the earth instead of heavenly. Locked down here instead of brought up to God's reality. When I say you, me, <laughs> I mean, you know, the scriptures say uh, of the Jews or Gentiles, there's no difference. Applies to me. It's absolutely true. Okay, well, let's just address the momentary place that we're at in the Lord. God is screaming. I'm ready. This is the appointed time. Well, we look at the Jews when Jesus came. And he says, and the, the appointed time Jesus came and, you know, da -da -da -da, we go, yeah, but some of them people, Jesus wept over them. You know, he wept over Jerusalem because Jerusalem wasn't being slain by his nature, but was standing firm against his nature, me. And so they took me to the cross. They will take me to the cross. Well, he wasn't weeping over going to the cross. He's a lamb of God, for God's sake. He's, he's going to be okay. It's us he's weeping over. So most of his life, people served Pharaoh's every need. He was given great power, a great name in the earth, control over many people, possessions, lands, etc. In contrast to that, Israel lived in slavery for 400 years. Now, we, we look at Pharaoh as the one who didn't get any mercy, and these guys that did, and they're coming, and they've been for, four, you know, this is like covering two days here, three at the most, the Passover. And 400 years before that, they were slaves to this guy who gets everything he wants. And when he says, take straw away from their bricks that they're making, make it harder for them, that's what happens to them. They never got to say that. They never got that kind of blessing. It wasn't, wouldn't be blessing to get that. It would, it, would, it would curse themselves and destroy themselves and any hope of becoming in the image of Christ if he put these slaves of three days ago, put into their hand any kind of power, it takes a long time to conform to the image of Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. And what, what's the resistance? Us. Mm. Throw, it talks about that. Throwing off the arm of the Lord. It's reactions. And it's not always to him, but it is. It's our reaction to this, and then we throw his arm up because that's him. Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. No, God would never put somebody like him in charge. Let's see, Daniel 4.17 is what I read, if you want to reread it. <clears throat> God's not, all things work together. Base leaders are great, wonderful, perfect leaders. You know, we're, so I don't like Obama. 
It says God puts, raises up and sets down. Well, I like, you know, George Bush or this or that or whoever's coming down the pike now. Hillary or whatever, I don't know. Ultimately, it really doesn't matter. I mean, pray for them. But ultimately, it really doesn't matter if you're a son of God by Christ. If you're not, then that's a big deal. Well, we need to, we need to hire ourselves a sniper and take him out. Watch this go over the internet. And I'm, I'm dead. I'm dead. But that's what happens. People's minds get twisted, and they think they're right. And they think, you know, they're going to kill somebody and do God's service. No, they're not. But they're standing up for God in some cases, in many cases. Many cases. For most of his life, God had shown mercy to this king, this Pharaoh. But he eventually turned against God's people, which is to turn against the Lord. As long as they're in slavery for 400 years and no uprising, he, he likes them because they're... They're helping to build what he likes. But he turned. The blessing of power becomes a curse to others when we use it to our own ends. I mean, Jesus uses what he has to cover us, to bless us, to bring us along. I'm not talking about that he doesn't put us through our paces. He, he does and he will. But it's still love that motivates his heart. But we can't see love in his heart, so we can't tell what's, what's God and what's not God. Well, this person is nice to me. Maybe they're nice to you because they have their motives that are wrong. And this one is nice to you or not nice to you but they had their motives and that might be Jesus but we couldn't recognize Jesus if he sat in front of us in this class well, I, don't, I don't know I think Jesus you know you're on a, a one of those TV contest shows which one's Jesus would the real Jesus stand up you know but we go through the contest going well let's see how, you know, we're asking our questions and stuff so we go this is the real Jesus. And they go, no, that's not. That's Satan. But <laughs> Jesus, you know. <laughs> and he comes as, a, as an angel of light. And it, it looks so right. And you're deceived. So go to the back of the line or whatever, you know. And, and, and if, we, if there was such a show, if there really existed such a show and we were on it, we would probably fail. Because we can't discern motive. We can only see and feel, sense realm, what we like or don't like. That's why, you know, the other day I played that song. I think it was a Sunday night. The truth is the light. You should hear the, the chorus words to that. I should, I should write it down instead of play it again because it used a bad word. <clears throat> Not too bad. It's, it's so good. David said, what was it? Something like, smite me. It'll be, a, it'll be a precious ointment to me. In thy mercy he hath smitten me. These are things that David said, and he's, he turned out all right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but we're all, we don't want to turn out all right. We want to turn all right according to what we call mercy, which is actually cursing. And not true mercy. Not true mercy. <clears throat> the blessing of power becomes a curse to others when we use it to our own ends. God had warned of the coming destruction and the need, talking about in, in Egypt. He had warned. And the need for a lamb but Pharaoh wouldn't embrace weakness and dem uh, as demonstrated by the lamb's death and blood. <clears throat> Instead, he used his power to maintain control. 
I don't see any value in killing a lamb. A dead lamb is not power to Pharaoh. It's foolishness. The lamb and the demonstration of its power were looked upon by Pharaoh as a curse and as his enemy. Why? Because he didn't go with the lamb. He wasn't of the lamb. He wasn't of that spirit. He didn't understand the lamb. And so it ended up his, his firstborn died. And he's blaming the lamb and the people of the lamb. Because how can you say this thing's good when it's not good? Well, it depends. You know, it's kind of like a, a sword. Depends on which end of it you're on. <laughs> you know, if you're on the pointy end of it, it may not be too good. Pharaoh despised the lamb's power. The same lamb that was one person's everything became another person's nemesis. So Pharaoh responded like those in Romans 1 and 2. He had been blessed by God, but now he turned on him. Look, anybody remember Romans 1 and 2? And they, were, they had the blessing of God, the knowledge of God, and all this stuff, and they ended up turning when the lamb doesn't suit them. Scott? God showed mercy on Israel in sparing their firstborn, which at, at this stage is Christ in them. We'll see that later, but just a little hint. In God's mind, he spared the firstborn to bring him out. We'll see it later. <clears throat> but did not show mercy in the in the sense that he did not remove his requirement of the road of glorification is to stu suffer with him. So we're talking about the difference between Romans 8, 17. Did I put that down here? The difference of Romans 8, 17, the first half and the second half. The first half deals with being heirs of God and, and getting stuff because of the death of the lamb. The second half of that verse is if we be joined heirs with Jesus, then God calls us to suffer with him by that nature and because of that spirit, not just suffering. There's no virtue in just plain suffering. There's none. I never advocate, well, let's just suffer. I advocate being with Jesus. And the scriptures have a lot to say about being with him in his sufferings. Being with him in his. Not him being with us in ours. But we still do that. We still do it. We do it more regularly than we are with him. And if we're with him in his sufferings at times, we don't want to be in it because we don't see the point of it because we don't understand the spirit behind it. And so it's just torture. It's just, it's that, it's that stupid cross teaching, which happens to be the very thing that saved each and every one of us, but we're against it if you take it outside of me getting everything. There in Romans 8, 17, we see the difference between being heirs of God in contrast to being joint heirs with Jesus. And yet God views suffering with Christ as a blessing. And that, uh, a couple of classes ago, I quoted Philippians 1, where it talks about being blessed or graced to suffer with him. Okay, well, that's, that's more than mercy. 
Now we say, give me mercy to get me out of this, being with Jesus, but we don't see that we're with Jesus because we're not. Just like, just like the Jews, just like Judah in captivity or before the captivity, this is not God. It is God. God, have mercy on me. Get me out of this. No. I'm going to have mercy on you and keep you in and send you into a far country until I can bring you back into my heart. I'm not giving up on you. This is mercy. No, it's not. I will fight you tooth and nail, Jesus. But we don't, we'd never say that. But we do. We do. And we can't, you know, it's like, as long as I'm in class, I understand this. <laughs> but the minute I walk out that door and have some kind of trial, I don't, you know, I mean, I used to say, is this God? Is this the devil? Is this the flesh? Is this, I mean, I had a list. I, I was trying to figure out. I did. It was like, I don't know what this is, you know? And then I ended up writing that book, Troubles and Trials, Stumbling Block and Stepping Stones. But anyway, that, because I, the Lord began to help me divide out certain things. But one thing's for sure, it was the devil that helped hang Jesus on the cross. Can I get an amen? And Jesus didn't go, well, I'm going to resist this. I resist you, Satan. You get up there. You deserve it. You're the bad one. I'm the good one. I'm, I'm the son of God. And God's pleased with me. That's, that's us, people. <laughs> of God. He's the devil. He should suffer. All right, so our next subtitle here is what kind of mercy do we desire? Question mark. What kind of mercy do we desire? Sounds like a poem, doesn't it? Never mind. What kind of mercy do we desire? Do we desire the mercy of God that was given to Pharaoh, but reject the lack of mercy given to Israel by their 400-year bondage to, and, uh, and slavery to the man and country God blessed? In other words, we, we don't want the lack of mercy that God has brought us down into Egypt and made us slaves To one day reveal the lamb. We don't want that mercy. We want Pharaoh mercy. Do we desire the mercy of God in terms of blessing and provision for our every need in this life as was the case with Pharaoh? Or are we open to the mercy of God in allowing us to be called to follow the Lamb, even into his sufferings and bearing his reproach? Okay, so, so the law, and see, this is, this is so huge in Romans. Romans 10, but also Romans 3 and 4. The law, the law, no. I can see the Jews. No, we're, don't tell us about this cross thing. Don't tell us about this Jesus that was a nobody. It was a carpenter's son. I don't even know if he could make anything. Just tell us what the law says because we know God gave the law to us. We know Moses was of God. We don't know if this Christ crucified guy is of God. I don't know. I have much more history to go to fall back on in relationship to the law. And besides, it feels right. I need to be better. I need to do good. I need to, I need to apply myself. I need to, uh, you know, commit myself more. I need to yield more. I need, I, I, I will be like the most high God. I will Ascend into the heavens. I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm quoting the <laughs> devil now. <laughs> I 
Apparently, he's closer to some of you than you realize. <laughs> I vote for this. That's the devil. <laughs> no. I will be like the most high God. Yes, I want to be like God. I will ascend to heaven. Will you ascend up on the cross? No. I don't believe in that method. I see nothing in it. I want to blame everybody else because why? Because I see fault in everybody else. Don't you know that when Jesus walked the earth, everybody, when he was around them, all he heard was garbage that came out of their mouth in the sense that their motives were all wrong and selfish and self-centered. You know, James and John, sweet James and John gets mom to take them to Jesus and go, uh, ask, you come on, go ahead mom, ask. Can my son sit on the right hand and on the left of you when you come to your kingdom? Jesus gone. <laughs> and he said, can you, can, can you drink of the cup I'm going to drink of? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. We all, you do realize we all have to drink of that cup. We all have to drink of that cup. I had a thought. <laughs> Isn't there a book called God Calling? Is it Mike? Is it Jesus? Yeah. Then give it to me. <laughs> Pardon? Or, good. I think Jesus has got my number. Oh. oh. I've always loved Steve. Anybody that knows me and my relationship with Steve, I've always loved him. And when he would try to drive me crazy with his circles, I don't think like a regular human. I would give him stuff that would just go down. <laughs> Jesus hung on that cross, and God did not show mercy and save him. He allowed a simple trial to escalate into a kangaroo court. At that moment, he is not showing mercy toward his son, but he is showing mercy towards we who should be crucified there instead of him. But can we identify mercy? Amen. Do you see what I mean? I mean, the, the whole of chapter 9, or at least a large portion of it, has to do with what is our definition of mercy. Can we see, can we comprehend what God means when he says that? Or do we just make everything about our lives on this earth at this moment? Well, I, you know, and it's, it's always one of two things. I like this, I don't like that. My, that's my preferences. And the world will, it'll always be at one another's throats because everybody has different preferences. So there's no hope. Even in the Christian world, even in the church, for sure. Maybe more so, it seems like to me. So we, 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 see, we see that which we want. I don't want captivity. Then Jesus would say, then you don't, then you don't want me. I mean, that's the ultimate end of it. Then you don't want me. No, I don't. I, I, yes, I want you, but I don't want you that way. Yeah, I want you in a way that's going to make me happy, not you happy. Lord, can we concentrate on making me happy? And he would go, no, no. We're going to concentrate, in, concentrate on getting you to Calvary. We're going to get you to the cross. OK, well, Lord, it's not going to be easy because I'm going to go kicking and screaming to the altar. I won't 
I won't take you that way. There's only one way I'll take you. You have to be in me because I'm the only one willing to go. Lord, being in you means the first thing it means is the cross, my death. Yes. I don't want that. You know, Lord, there are other people who teach different things, better things. And he would probably say, well, go check it out then. I mean, he probably would. He wouldn't say, no, you idiot. <laughs> the cross is the way. He'd go, go enjoy yourself then. If, that's, if you're not going to be a willing sacrifice, the willingness isn't to go to the cross. The willingness is to be found in him. He'll take you to the cross. If we love him, we'll be willing to be in him. If we love ourselves, we will not go to the cross. So the, our only hope is to love him. That's our only hope. It's either love ourselves or love him. <laughs> and not a lot of people want those, those choices. to get going <laughs> all right the greater plan it's called lamb power <clears throat> though Pharaoh was blessed by God in so many ways yet the Lord's real purpose behind raising him up was not for all the benefits he would get but to use him to use Pharaoh in his assault on the sun. Just like it did Nebuchadnezzar. And there we don't understand that either. But to use him on his assault on the sun. And we'll prove that it was an assault on the sun probably next class. In the midst of Pharaoh's use of his power, God wanted to show his own power in relation to Pharaoh. The power that God displayed toward Pharaoh was a simple little lamb, but it brought down Pharaoh's kingdom and power. It brought, it brought Pharaoh's kingdom and power crumbling down. For years prior to this, he was raised up and made to stand in that place of power so that eventually by his opposition, the power of the lamb would be seen as the greatest power. Okay. So we wonder if you're going to follow the lamb, we wonder if you're going to embrace this, this one, this, I mean, we're going to marry this one. We wonder why it gets so bad, and I, I'll address that too. We wonder why it gets so bad at certain times, so extreme. What? Well, it has to, and it has to for a lot of different reasons. One is us, because we have. It's going to take extremes for us, and the other one is to prove that lamb power is stronger than Pharaoh power or world dominion power. Book of Daniel. Book of Daniel. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see. Do I want to... I think I'm going to stop right here. And what we're going to do in the next class is do nothing but read. No, not really. <clears throat> Uh, no, we're not that bad. Um, we're going to start seeing some of the actual real issues of Romans 9 here of what we've been talking about. So far, we have not really addressed God's real issue. But this, what we've just read about land power, has brought us up to the, the, the base of the throne that has the lamb sitting on it, and there we're going to see the slain lamb reign. All right, so let's take a break.